Welcome, everybody. My name is Francesco Spagnolo. I'm the curator of the Magnus. And uh, as some of you may know, in 2017, the Magnus received a, a very important gift to buy an art collection, the, the largest collection documenting the life and work of uh, Polish, then American artist, Artur Schick. Um, as we go through the collection, it's a, you know, 450 uh, artworks and uh, hundreds of, of drawings and other materials and ephemera and so on. As we wade through the collection, we wanted to start thinking about the collection as a whole. And um, we invited a variety of Berkeley scholars to come and help us think, think through it. So we started a series uh, last month with, uh, with a talk on the Passover Haggadah. Artur Schick famously illustrated a, a Haggadah for, for, for Passover uh, that was published in London in 1939. And um, this week, we are focusing on another important aspect of Schick's work, which is his work, his propaganda work. He was uh, a, a one-man uh, propaganda machine. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt referred to him as a soldier in art, said that he was worth a whole battalion of, of soldiers. He was very active in depicting in very gruesome, vicious ways uh, the um, leaders of the, of the Axis. He has a particular focus for all kinds of good reasons uh, on Nazi Germany. Uh, but not only, he really had um, visual uh, ideas, visual and literary puns uh, to expose the, the, the broad project of uh, nationalist socialism and in general fascism in Europe and in the world. Uh, to the world itself. And he was very successful at doing this. As you can see, looking around this room, we have some enlarged, Arthur Schick was a miniaturist, so his, uh, his uh, images were all very small. We enlarged them in, in the auditorium on the walls. You, you see that he, he, he was very, very specific in, in, his, in his aim. And in thinking about his work, we thought about, well, what, what was he really up against? And this is where our friend and colleague, Isabel Richter, came. Uh, to help with her research and study of uh, propaganda, and especially, as we will learn today, the use of photography as a, as a propaganda arm of the National Socialist, National Socialist uh, Project in, in, in Germany. So just a couple of words. You, you received an invitation. You know who Isabel Richter is, but she's the AAD professor. So it's, it's an invited professorship uh, at UC Berkeley, at the Department of History and Department of German at the University of California, Berkeley. She received a PhD from the Technical University in Berlin in 2000 and Habilitation from the University of Bochum in 2009. Her research, as we will have a, a way to, to hear tonight, her research interests include cultural history and anthropology, the history of national socialism and popular cultures and youth cultures in the 20th century. Um, she's a wonderful resource for us and she's, uh, her classes are regular visitors at the Magnus, so she's a familiar face for many of us here, and we're really grateful to you, Isabel, for uh, giving the talk tonight. So please help me welcome Isabel Victor to the stage. Thank you. So thanks a lot. Good evening. Um, it's a great honor to be here, and I'm really looking forward uh, to this talk. Uh, my starting point uh, tonight is one of Arthur Schick's um, anti-Nazi caricatures. Arthur Schick, as you might know, emigrated as a Polish Jew to the United States in 1940 via Canada after living in Paris and London. In the US, his caricatures appeared in various newspapers and magazines. The Schickelgruber Lohengrin caricature which, caricature, which you see on my slide here, was published in several newspapers in 1943. The New York Post, the Detroit Michigan News, and The Voice. We see Hitler as a perplexed patchwork warrior. Caricatures exaggerate to reveal the caricaturist's truth. And the caricature does not work without the correspondence of image and text. On the top left, uh, the text in Russian says, Lohen Green Wolf, who thinks that he can get into the sheep fold to got himself into the kennel. 
And on the right side of the caricature, you can read Schickelgruber Lohengrin to the Red Army, who stole the show by taking away his swan of invincibility. And I would like to thank Shir Kohani to share this information with me. Schickelgruber is the name of Hitler's paternal grandmother, who was an unmarried um, a woman, so it's not clear who, uh, who, was, who was really a Hitler's grandfather. Schick also refers to Hitler's known admiration for Richard Wagner's music. Here he refers to Wagner's opera Lohengrin, which was perform performed for the first time in 1850. Um, Lohengrin is based on a medieval tale of Parzifal by Wolfram von Eschenbach. Lohengrin, a knight, is sent to defend the Duchess of Brabant while guided by a swan. Uh, he marries the Duchess on condition that she must never ask about his origin. As she breaks the promise, Lohengrin is forced to leave her. In this cartoon, Hitler is identified as Schickelgruber Lohengrin, and Schick expresses support of the Red Army fighting the Germans on the Eastern Front. The inscription on the lower right of the caricature to the Red Army who stole the show by taking away the swan of invincibility, this cartoon, cartoon also alludes to Stalingrad when Schick's, Schick lets the Hitler figure wear old worn out boots exposing his bare feet, his bare toes. The German army was defeated in January 1943. And it is well known that General Friedrich Paulus contacted Hitler and requested that he'd be granted permission to surrender. Hitler rejected it on a point of honor. He telegraphed the Sixth Army in Stalingrad later that day, claiming that it had made a historic contribution to the great struggle in German history and that it should stand fast, quote, to the last soldier and the last bullet, unquote. Hitler seems, to, on this caricature, still seems to be ready to fight while a Russian soldier already carries away the dead swan of invincibility. I will focus here tonight on visual culture, but on a different medium of visual culture. And in contrast uh, to caricatures and their potential to exaggerate and sometimes taking something, something to a point of extreme, extremes to reveal the caricaturist's truth, I will talk about images with a more affirmative character. And when I talk about photography, one important question to me is always, what does photography reveal what other sources cannot show? And I will discuss two photographers as cases to show in what ways photos open a window to ideology in, of national, to the ideology of national socialism. In recent literature, snapshot photography and private photos have been analyzed to explore appropriations of Nazi ideology. And I'm thinking here of the, at least in Germany, well-known exposition of the Hamburg Institute of Social Science. They focused on photos taken by Wehrmacht soldier and their images, their private images they had taken during the war. Um, when I am discussing tonight Hitler's private photographer Heinrich Hoffmann and Erna Lendwey Dirksen, I'm not highlighting snapshot photographers, but professionals who had high print runs in Nazi Germany. And I would like to explain a little bit why I chose these two um, cases or examples. Um, Heinrich Hoffmann is a well-known photographer of the Nazi period, so I thought he could be an interesting case, whereas the photographer Erna Lendwey Dirksen, I would say in Germany, even a lot of people who are familiar with the history of photography don't know her very well, maybe because she was a women photographer, and I thought it's, it would, could be interest, interesting to introduce her because she had also really high print runs uh, during the um, Nazi period. And I will start 
with uh, Heinrich Hoffmann. He's very often described as Hitler's private photographer. And I want to show here that being Hitler's private photographer included various tasks which, which also changed over time. Hoffmann was, a trained, was trained as photographer from 1909 to 1903 and worked in various German cities before he opened his first own photographic shop in Munich in 1909. He met Hitler in Munich in 1919 and joined the Nazi party in 1920. That was the year when the National Socialist Party was founded. So he was one of the very early Nazi party members. He documented the early Nazi, party, uh, Nazi party's development in the 1920s and he also worked as a photo reporter documenting the Hitler Putsch in 1923, which uh, the Putsch failed and um, Hitler was sentenced to two years um, in prison. From the very beginning of the Nazi, part, Na Nazi party's history, the ties were very close. In 1929, Hoffmann moves his photo sh studio, it was called Photo House Hoffmann, to Schellingstraße 50 in Munich, to the same building which was the Nazi party's headquarter in Munich between 1925 and 31. Among his employees was the 17, among Hoffmann's employees was the 17-year-old Eva Braun, who met Hitler in Hoffmann's photo studio in 1929 and became later Hitler's girlfriend. Hitler is usually presented as a bachelor, and there are not a lot of images uh, showing them together with his girlfriend, Eva Braun. On this photo here on my slide, you see Eva Braun and Hitler with Hitler's German shepherd Blondie in 1942. I could not find out how Eva Braun's uh, dog was called, so this is unknown. Um, <laughs> This photo of an unknown photographer was taken at the Berghof, uh, Adolf Hitler's home in Obersalzberg of the, Bav of the Bavarian Al Alps near Berchtesgaden in Bavaria in Germany. Historians suppose that they became a couple in 1932, but Hitler attached great importance to not being seen with his girlfriend in public. Eva Braun committed suicide together with Hitler in the Führerbunker in April uh, 45. In the 1920s, Hoffmann's photographic work was important to present the Nazi party as a um, significant, significant mass phenomenon and um, let the Nazi, Nazi party appear um, a bigger movement as it actually was. Um, and his photos were crucial to establish Hitler's image as, an, as a charismatic uh, figure. In this photo series shot by Hoffmann in 1927, so during the Weimar Republic, we see Hitler in various poses rehearsing gestures for his speeches. They were taken to perfect Hitler's performance as an orator. When the photographer Georg uh, Pahl portrayed Heinrich Hoffmann in 1933, you see him again on my slide, we see him here uh, in, in Nazi uniform holding his camera in one hand and a cigarette in the other hand. At that time, Hoffmann was already an established figure in the Nazi movement and belonged to Hitler's inner circle. Um, that Hoffmann was really part of um, Hitler's inner circle is also obvious on this photo showing um, Hitler's inner circle in 1940. And you can see Heinrich Hoffmann uh, on the very right side, on the right side um, in, on this uh, photo. Hoffmann's photographic focus changed after the seizure of power in 1933. So Hoffmann's visual work was on the one hand crucial 
for the a propagandistic image of Hitler as a strong leader, but his work was also key to present the Nazi movement as a young movement and to create a warm, human, and private image of Hitler. Although I would not say that Hoffmann portrayed Adolf Hitler's private life, he took many photos of Hitler in a, in a private environment. This photo you can see here on my slide was taken in 36 in Hitler's home in Bavaria, Haus Wachenberg, in the Obersalzberg of the Bavarian Alps near Berchtesgaden. We see him reading, wearing a woolen jacket, a shirt and a tie, surrounded by home decor, an embroidered cushion in form of a heart, mini plants on the windowsill, two traditional Bavarian wooden chairs, a bouquet of flowers in front of him. On this um, photo here, um, which was taken in uh, summer 1933, we also see Hitler in his home on a terrace in Berchtesgaden in summer 33, reading, this time in uniform, and joined by Hermann Göring, who was at that time the min uh, Prussian minister president, and he is wearing on this photo traditional uh, Bavarian leather shorts. These photos, which show Hitler in a more private environment, were probably not meant to be published. The notion of the private Hitler with the warm and human aura was nevertheless used by Hoffmann. This is much more obvious in Hoffmann's uh, photo books on Hitler. And um, this is the first photo book uh, Hoffmann published. It's called Jugend um Hitler, Youth Around um, Hitler. Uh, in, this, in Hoffmann's photo books, we see Hitler very often in a suit and not in Nazi uniform, surrounded by small children, someone who cares for children and who is a family man. Not the family in the traditional sense, the subtitle, the subtitle on the right side of um, here on uh, my slide um, reads Führer and Volk, a family, and alludes to the notion of the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community or the national community. It's a deeply racist utopia of racial homogeneity. When the Nazis came to power, Volksgemeinschaft or the national community was nothing that already existed, but was something that had to be created, applying practices of exclusion and practices of inclusion. Practices of exclusion are probably well known. The law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring and forced sterilization since 1934, the Nuremberg laws of November 35, the November pogroms of November 38, and the ascription of asocial and community aliens, only to mention some of them. Early practices of inclusion to create the national uh, or people's community included the marriage loan for young Aryan couples, the state-operated leisure organization Strength Through Joy, since 33, the winter aid to support the poorer Germans and the one pot meal Sunday. On the first Sunday of every month, every German family should replace their traditional lunch with a simple one pot meal, an Eintopf from the German Eintopf or one pot and set aside the savings for the charity drive. On those Sunday afternoons, collectors around the country knocked on the door to recuperate the money. Even families who didn't want to cook were expected to join in. Restaurants were legally obligated to offer appropriately inexpensive Eintopf meals uh, at a reduced rate on the designated Sundays. When we see Hitler in Hoffmann's picture book on um, the left side here feeding a little girl soup, 
the subtitle says, little children have to eat a lot of soup. So without doubt, only the wished and wanted children of the national community were addressed here. When I'm talking here about propaganda, I'm not first and foremost focusing on how harassment, discrimination, exclusion and the killings were legitimized and normalized. This is surely one important part of propaganda in the Third Reich. I am concentrating here on another aspect and I'm focusing on those who were wished and wanted and how the Nazis tried to convince them to support their system. I don't believe that propaganda means brainwashing people. Propaganda is a specific form of communication and it's not only about the senders or the national socialists. Propaganda requires people who believe in the sender's message and who are willing to appropriate this message. And without doubt, the German resistance who existed was a very small minority, but it is important to keep the resistance in mind because it shows that propaganda did not impact all Germans. I already mentioned the Volksgemeinschaft, the national community or people's community did not simply spring to life in 1933. Notions of a people's community had already been discussed in the early 20th century and also during the Weimar Republic, so in the 1920s. But the national socialists had to create their version of a people's community. Students learned in new school books about Aryans at, as privileged master race. So, but how do the Aryans look like? We know that famous or well-known national socialists like Hitler, Göring, Goebbels, they were not real role models for Aryan outer appearance. So how could the Aryans be from the national socialists point of view, ideological point of view, how could they be identified? The Nazis propagated the blood and ancestors, but it was also about ideals of outer appearance. And the German photographer Erna Lendwey Dirksen and her photo books with high print runs introduced German, Germans to Aryan facial features. And I'm arguing here that visual culture was crucial for politicizing bodies and race. Erna uh, Lendwey Dirksen, you, he, you see her on one of the few photos, uh, it's a self-portrait, was born in uh, 1883 as a daughter of a gentleman uh, farmer and his wife in Wetterburg in Hesse. She studied painting for two years in Kassel uh, and she was married twice to Adolf Göschel, and after her divorce, she married the Hungarian composer um, Erwin, Erwin Lendwey. By that time, she had already begun her training as photographer at the well-known Letterhaus for Photography in Berlin. The Letter Association was a German edu educational organization for applied arts founded in 1866 in Berlin with the same main object to promote women's education and the improvement of, the work of women's working capacities. The latter association was, a middle, um, was associated with, the, with a middle class vision of appropriate women's work around 1900. There were classes for dressmaking, machine sewing, hairdressing, uh, at the Letterverein cooking school, the pupils cooked for a restaurant for ladies uh, attached to the building. Several well-known photographers, German photographers of the 20th century, um, graduated uh, from the Letterverein. For instance, uh, Marianne Breslauer, Anna Köppen, Frieda Ries, they were all uh, letter students. Since 
in the mid 19th century, so uh, the uh, photography was patented in 1839 and women had always worked in their parents or fathers or brothers studios in the 19th century. But until the early 20th century, uh, photography was really a male um, domain. So since 1990, the Letter Association trained women photographers and enabled women to open their own studios. Anna Lentwey Dirksen left the Letter Association before graduating and opened her first studio in Berlin Charlottenburg in 1916. She was a successful photographer and portrayed um, public figures of the Weimar Republic. Among her clients were, uh, was, for instance, the department store in Berlin, KDW, the Berlin Opera. In 1925, she published her first photo book. Uh, the German title is Unsere Zeit in 77 Frauenbildnissen, so Our Time in 77 Women's Portrait. And her portrait is um, in this book on um, women's portrait of the Weimar Republic. In 1926, she started a new project and exhibited for the first time her, I um, will first of all um, mention the German title, Volksgesichter, Faces of the People. And she received the title of a master craftsman and focused after 26 exclusively on faces of uh, the people. And um, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that Anna Landwey Dirksen is not that well known. I discovered her because my second book was a book on the history of cultural history of death and the end of life. And I was uh, very interested in her, her photography because her photo books included the faces of older human beings, of older people, and I thought this is really, uh, was really unusual. Um, today I would interpret her photography a in, a, in a different way, but this was my starting point. On this photo, uh, of, on this photo by Erna Landwey Dirksen, we see the face of Mrs. Gesche H. from Elbmarschen, that's a town close to Hamburg in the north of Germany. Erna Landwey Dirksen focused on her wide open eyes. Although taken in black and white, we see her speckled, uh, uh, freckled facial skin, which might also have a slight tan. She is wearing a black scarf, and we see the color of what seems to be a traditional gown. Frontality was not a stylistic element exclusively used by Erna Landwey Dirksen. It was used by several photographers trained in metropolitan context, a milieu Erna Landwey Dirksen was uh, critical of. And I was, when I started to, um, to interpret her photos, I was interested, is this a usual way to portray women in the Weimar Republic? And I would say in the 1920s, women could, port could be portrayed in very different ways in the 1920s. Here we see the photographer, uh, Florence Henri, portrayed by her colleague, Lucia Molinac, and this en face image also focused on the eyes, but it is very clear that Lucia Molinac is presenting a cosmopolitan modern woman with an up-to-date short haircut and bangs, wearing makeup and underlining her fashionable earrings. We only see some small parts of her graphic blouse or shirt. Um, Henri, Florence ha ha Henri Florence's head is slightly slanted. Her ver a, a vertical line cuts part of her right cheek. So Lucia Molinat is presenting her colleague as emancipated cosmopolitan woman and avant-garde artist of her time. Another interesting um, question before I start to present uh, the photos she published during the Nazi era is, I was also interested in the question whether Erna Landwey Dirksen started as an ethnographic 
photographer in the tradition of the Weimar Republic. And I'm thinking here of photographers like August Sander, for instance, or Walter, uh, Walter Bauhaus, who dedicated his work to the elderly, the less fortunate, the outsiders, and the poor in the Weimar Republic. And you can see here one photo of Ballhauser's photo book um, that's um, a um, photo book uh, focusing on the victims of the um, First World War. Anna Landwey Dirksen also starts in the 1920s portraying the elderly and their regional faces, but she does not really address the, uh, the rural population. Her topic is the peasant as epitome or type who is deeply tied to his or her regional soil. Her starting point was the notion that facial features reflect a person's nature and regional origin. As you can see on this slide, um, um, one of her portraits, uh, a 90-year-old 90, 90 peasant of the Lechtal, 90-jähriger Bauer aus dem Lechtal. Her portraits are supposed to seem documentary in order to naturalize the folkish ideology and present it as if it was an objective fact, um, objective uh, fact, facts and uh, photographic evidence. But in contrast, her portraits were thoroughly staged. She used ultra-modern means, but not to portray people in their individuality, but to present them as types of a landscape. You, you can see here one portrait um, that, which was published in 35 uh, Missouri in, in her book, uh, Faces of the German East, and the photo is entitled Missourian Girl. Followed by photo books, uh, so this was Faces of the German East in 39, and it was followed by photo books on people's faces of Schleswig-Holstein, Tyrol, Vorarlberg, Lower, Lower Saxony, Mecklenburg, Pomerania. Once the Nazis um, occupied uh, territories, she published photo books on Flanders and Norway, um, only on those uh, photo books on those occupied territories where the Nazis believed in the existence of the so-called Aryan blood. Her first books were published in the editorial houses Kulturelle Verlagsgesellschaft Berlin and Drei Masken Verlag. I'm mentioning this because in the Weimar Republic, her books were published by um, uh, editorial houses which published first and foremost books on theater. After 33, Lentwey Dirksen's photo books were published by Gau Verlag Bayreuth which was part of the National Socialist editorial house Franz Ea Nachfolger, which apart from Dirksen's publications did not fo focus on photography. In total, up to 300,000 copies of her photo books were printed during the uh, complete, the whole time between 33 and 45. Erma Lendwey images were also used in Nazi literature, for instance, Friedrich Merkenschlager's publication on racial specifica and so-called mixed races. That was a book that was published in 33. Contemporary critiques praised Lendwey Dirksen's, I'm quoting, true enthusiasm for the Nordic race, unquote. Her photos were also printed in anti-Semitic and anti-Soviet hate brochures like the, like the journal Der Untermensch, the subhuman, in 1942. Nevertheless, I would not interpret her uh, photos as proponent of anthropometric anthropom photography. You can interpret her photos um, in the tradition and longer lines of the historia, history of physion, physiognomy in Western Europe since the late uh, 18th century. 
And I would say she is first and foremost a proponent of the blood and soil ideology. Blood and soil is the slogan um, expressing the 19th century German idealization of a racially defined national body that's associated with the word blood and united with the settlement era, um, area, soil. Blood and soil idealized rural life as a counterweight to urban life but it also combined but it is also combined with racist and anti-semitic ideas of a sedentary germanic nordic peasantry as opposed to a specifically jewish nomadism the nazi concept of lebensraum living space the belief that the german people needed to reclaim historically german areas of Eastern Europe into which they could expand is also tied to blood and soil. The epitome of race and soil in Anna Lentwey Dirksen's work is the peasant. She creates analogies between faces, landscapes, and a specific bond and attachment with the rural location. From Lentwey Dirksen's view, the imprint is so deep that the Aryan rural face is the expression of a landscape. Like in Arthur Schick's caricature, the message can only be interpreted if the image is read together with the text. The Völkisch dimensions of Landwey Dirksen's photo books become clear in the correspondence between photos and subtitles. In her photo book on the Germanic people's face, Das Germanische Volksgesicht, in Flanders, and you see two images uh, um, which were published in this book, and on the next side, after these two images, we learn, and I'm quoting here, uh, in northern Germany, the source of Germanic blood, there is a strong outbreak, Ausbruch, along the coast to Flanders, even until deep into northern France, where the Flemish language vanished, but the blood remained imper imperturbable." Unquote. Um, so this means, from her point of view, it is clear that um, we see uh, that the face of the Belgian man on the right side, he, from her point of view, still um, presents um, Aryan features, facial features, whereas the man on the left side, he's from southern France, is not Aryan, cannot be Aryan uh, anymore. The Aryan peasant is the source of blood rejuvenation, and from the Völkisch ideolo ideological point of view, it is not a surprise that um, the faces in her photo books become younger and younger. The portrait children are mostly blonde, they look healthy, well nourished, and have austere facial expressions. This little blonde girl, for instance, stands for the thoughtfulness and willpower of the Germanic in inheritance. Anna Landwey Dirksen also accepted the offer to document the construction of the Reichsautobahn, the national highway, a propagandistic large scale project which the Nazis started in 1933. And it's an interesting book. She portrays a lot of different workers um, they, uh, with their traditional clothes, and we see them, um, yeah, um, being involved in constructional work. But on the last page of, this, of the book on the National Highway, uh, we, see, we also see this uh, photo here. This is also supposed to be a worker of the uh, National Highway. And um, uh, I would say that's an image of ideal Aryan masculinity. So we see a white, muscular, slim man with short, shaven, blonde hair, a slightly tanned worker, against a black background, not the Reichsautobahn, uh, who seems to look confidently into the future. Um, at the end of my talk, some concluding remarks. 
Whereas Heinrich Hoffmann, as Hitler's private photographer, was crucial for Hitler's image as a strong leader of a young um, movement close to his people and responsible for Hitler's human aura, creating images, images that suggest closeness, warmth, and empathy. Anna Lentwey Dirksen is in a different way important for the creation of the people's community. The national community was not simply there. It had to be created making use of practices of exclusion and inclusion. Anna Lentwey Dirksen revalued the rural population, suggesting that Germanic peasants are the source of Aryan blood and highlights their privileged role in the German Lebensraum, the living space. At the same time, she also taught Germans how Aryans look like, and that also means how can Aryans and non-Aryans be identified. Propaganda, the word and the idea, is widely invoked, but there is much disagreement and sometimes confusion what it means, uh, confusion about its meaning. For a long time, propaganda was um, associated with brainwashing the German population. In more recent academic literature, propaganda has been used to designate certain types of persuasive message and manipulative practices. And first and foremost, propaganda is a specific form of communication, including a context, a sender, an intent, a message, a channel, an audience, and a response. So propaganda is as much about confirming as about converting public opinion. This shift of emphasis also changed the perception of the role of the German population. Germans were not seduced by, the, by Nazi propaganda. For a majority, propaganda seemed to work because it reinforced existing beliefs, attitudes, and stereotypes of the many. On the other hand, I argued that the notion of the people's community had a longer tradition in the early 20th century. Um, but the Nazis had to create a specific, her, their specific version of a Volksgemeinschaft. Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community, was a central propagandistic topic to introduce the true harmony of the classes, the principle of community before the individual, and racial uh, purity. This utopia, or maybe I should say dystopia, of racial homogeneity required practices of inclusion and exclusion. Whereas I see Hoffmann's role rather in working on Hitler's profile and image as a strong leader with an em empathetic touch, Anna Landwey Dirksen's photos were more important to teach Germans how Aryan faces look like to support the anti-intellectual and anti-urban tendencies and to foster the blood and soil, soil ideology. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much for your lecture, very interesting. I do have a question to do with the Bauhaus, uh, their school of photography. Mm -hmm. And um, I am particularly aware of one particular photographer who studied there from Slovakia and she returned, they were more left wing, you know, but she put her work into 
exposing the social elements of the society, you know, usually the downtrodden, mm -hmm. the, the hardworking, the, um, and I wonder, did Bauhaus have any, um, any connection with uh, people like, like Erna, uh, and um, w were they affected by Bauhaus, or did any of them study there, uh, or was there some sort of a, a Bauhaus photographers, were they active in Germany in Nazi propaganda? Yeah, so um, I think there's at least two questions. Um, yes. And I start with the first one. Um, so I, what I try to underline here is that um, Anna Landwey Dixon's photos are in a way very yeah. traditional topics, but her photographic technique was not traditional at all. So she was very influenced by the modern Weimar uh, photographic tradition. And for instance, in German, in German we say the tradition of uh, Neues Sehen, which was introduced by the Bauhaus photography. I would say in her 1920s photos, she was definitely influenced by this tradition. I could not, I don't, I don't think that she studied with Bauhaus photographers, but she was surely influenced uh, technically, from a photographic technique. Um, if Bauhaus photographers were involved in Nazi propaganda, so I couldn't, I don't think so, but I'm not sure. This is something I really have to check. I would say no, but I'm not really sure, so I cannot really answer your question. Uh, so with uh, this photographer, is there documentation or correspondence indicating what her thought process, what her intent was? And, ah. was, and secondly, um, was there any solid connection with the National Socialist yeah. Party for her efforts? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, I don't know anything about Anna Landwey Dirksen's explicit intention. And what I try to do here is to interpret the correspondence between texts and images to show that in the Weimar Republic, she still worked in a different way. Um, I'm pretty sure that she allowed that her photos were published in National Socialist propagandistic um, uh, journals or books. Uh, racist book, so I, I'm, I don't believe that this would have been possible without a photographer agreeing to this. But I have, I have no written texts um, where, where I could say, okay, now we have her explicit intent. I think in this case, all you can do is to uh, know something about her biography, um, contextualize her photographic techniques, see how her photographic work changed, um, yeah, know where her photos were published during the Third Reich, but it's a very a good question. I have no information um, that focuses on her explicit intent. She was not member of the um, Nazi mm. party, but I would ask what does it mean? For instance, um, yeah, she wasn't a party member. Um, oh, the famous fi filmmaker, Eleni Riefenstahl, for instance. She wasn't a Nazi party member either, but it's very clear that she belonged to Hitler's uh, inner circle. So my question would al always be, okay, if we know that someone was a par Nazi party member, what or was not, what does it tell us? Um, I wouldn't... Today, I would not describe her as a, like a convinced national socialist. I think she was someone who really benefited from the Nazi, from the Nazi system. And um, she, she used a specific ideology to work during the Third Reich. 
So after 45, for instance, she was not arrested. We know that Heinrich, in contrast to Heinrich Hoffmann, who was arrested in 45 as a major offender, who was sentenced to five years in prison and to work later on in a small Bavarian town, um, Anna Landwey Dirksen was not arrested. She, um, she lived in a small town in Bavaria. After, it's interesting, after uh, 45, she did not uh, um, publish portraits anymore, but very interesting landscape photography. Um, and she was discovered uh, by the uh, West German women's movement. I saw photos uh, of Anna Landwey Dirksen for the first time in an exhibition that fo focused on uh, an exhibition catalog of the 1970s that focused on um, excellent women photographers of the 1920s. And I, I saw her photos and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I want to know more about her. So, yeah. Thank you very much. It's very interesting to me. The, this question of physiognomy as describing deeper features of not only the human being but the social structure isn't just limited, of course, to this one uh, strand, starting, say, with romantic notions, yes. uh, yeah. blood and soil and on. Uh, there was a very uh, uh, interesting effort in the 1930s by Jewish uh, publication to show the great variety of faces of Jews around the world in order to dispel the cruder and cruder anti-Semitic yeah. caricatures, including actual photographers. Mm -hmm. So you have the Uzbek Jew with his uh, cap, embroidered cap. You have the uh, Scandinavian Jews, light, light, more light blonde than the most light blonde uh, Aryan, and so on and so forth. So this notion, that, uh, that, of course, was more of a defensive uh, kind of book, but it also showed a, a deep belief, it seems to me, in this notion that uh, physiognomy is, uh, uh, is socially constructive mm -hmm. and constructed. Yes, and you, you already mentioned, um, it's, I think it's um, one approach to, for instance, interpret Anna Landwey Dirksen's in a much longer tradition if you um, think of the um, um, physiognomical studies of Lavata in the late 18th century, then um, a more, um, I, I would say, more racist approach in the 19th century, for instance, um, Gall and Karus. And it plays a role in all the so-called scientific uh, racial um, uh, approaches of the late 19th century. So this is surely one way to interpret or to contextualize her, her photos. And that's the um, interesting information uh, which you mentioned here in your statement. So thanks a lot, I noted this. Yeah, one thing I'll cross over to our side of the ocean. I was a photographer in the 80s and had a lot of photography books and vintage photography books. And one, and one of book that I'm very sorry I don't have still, I've been sorry I haven't had it for about 20 years, but uh, it was a book on portrait photography and there was about a seven or eight page spread showing people images just like that and showing how you can tell a person is stupid because yeah. of their chin and their forehead and their cheeks, well, the and it went on to describe them. Yeah. So it certainly wasn't just Germany. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my, my intention was not to highlight here that Anna Landwey Dixon was a unique uh, photographer. Of course, she communicated with photographers of her time, and she is one interesting case to show how um, yeah, how, in a way, Germans had to learn how do the Aryans really look like, because before 1933, 
um, most information was in written text, right, in this um, uh, racist literature on, on the Aryans and the, like, the interpretation of early linguistic literature in the early um, 19th century where the Aryans were mentioned for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, following up on this discussion on physiognomy, mm -hmm. um, um, I was wondering whether we could loop back to the caricatures mm -hmm. and also, you know, sort of, you know, think a little bit of how, how we would conceptualize the um, nexus between photography and the caricatures. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, on some level, of course, the, the you know, we could say the caricatures were playing off these um, racially aggrandizing heroic uh, photographs, maybe, right? Uh, that's one possibility to think about the nexus. But, but, but also beyond that, you know, so in terms of typification and, um, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, yes, uh, stereotyping mm -hmm. uh, you know so 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 I'm, I'm just curious how you would begin to think about that yeah. nexus between yeah. caricatures and photography yeah. in this context mm -hmm. yeah there are I would say there are some links where I, where I would say that caricatures and portraits have something in common or the portraits I showed here uh, especially if we think about um, presenting types and not are presenting a face because you are interested in the individuality. So um, stereotypes surely play a role in both uh, genres, I would say. But I see a lot of differences because, um, no, one more um, interesting um, connection is also both a, a caricaturist and someone who portrays people, they always try to present their version of the truth. Um, that might be a link, but uh, a caricature is making fun of something. It's totally exaggerating to show the caricaturist's truth. Um, and there I see, I would say, focusing on the technique, I see a lot of, I see more differences, I think. Yeah. But I have to think more about this because I uh, thought and wrote about photography and um, the caricatures were a new topic for me. But it's an interesting uh, question to like to um, dig more and think more about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I was very really interested in this. Um, I run a museum over in San Rafael called the International Museum of Propaganda. Mm -hmm. So I was particularly interested in what you had to say and how the Nazis used this uh, Aryan. It was popular in the beginning of, Latin, of the 20th century, but they did incorporate it to the ruination of the whole idea. Anyway, it was never a good idea. Um, what I am interested in is uh, these incredible, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Sikh? Sikh? Sikh. Beautiful posters, and I'm wondering, are, can I take pictures of them? Can, uh, have, could I acquire some of them? Uh, that are particularly good propaganda. I, I need them for my museum. So. And please come on over to San Rafael and see. It's a 20th century from all sides, international propaganda. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I do have one more question. Could I ask one more yeah. question? Um, I was raised in Czechoslovakia and under communism. And talking not about national socialism now, but international socialism, I see quite a lot of parallels mm -hmm. between, you know, the, the, the photography that was, uh, that, that you could see in the communist Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this time uh, maybe honoring the workers or, you know, the, again, the special types of Stakhanovites mm -hmm. and all this. Mm -hmm. and, 
And I do see the parallels uh, in that particular sense between the national socialists and the international socialists. They both used photography to promote their own images of what they thought was heroic. Uh, maybe it wasn't racial, but heroic, or you know. Uh, do you see those kind of parallels between, say, East German photography or yeah. communist photography and the national Abs socialist? Absolutely, some of the bodies you see in these photos look pretty similar. But my point is that the ideology, so the intent, is of course very, very different. But the technique to present bodies, for instance, mm -hmm. of course, some of them look pretty similar. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about this. But I wouldn't. I'm not sure if this would be for me an argument to really compare the two, like uh, socialist phot uh, or um, photos that were taken in socialist communist countries and national socialist photography, because the intention and the ideology seems to be pretty different. And this is more mm. important to me. But I agree with you. The aesthetics and the bodies you see, the way they are presented, there are a lot of parallels mm -hmm. in the 20th century, without doubt. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what I was talking about, the art element, no, yes. um, not the ideology. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was different. They wanted to promote Germany. These people wanted to see heroic labor. But, exactly. Yeah, but the, as you said, the aesthetics were yeah. quite yeah. comparable. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you.